Hello everyone, my name is Jeff and I'm with Cosley. For the month of July, we're excited to be partnering once again with H2 Open Doors to provide water for people around the world. This month, for every Facebook check-in, review, or recommendation, you're gonna be helping provide 50 gallons of clean, safe drinking water for someone in need. H2 Open Doors is a program of international rotary clubs with the long-term goal of providing access to clean, safe drinking water for one million people throughout developing nations. This team of volunteers at H2 Open Doors travel to areas around the world most in need of clean water, and they help install water filtration systems to provide drinking water for 10,000 people every day for 10 years. So let's all remember to check in this month and together we'll be providing safety and health through water. All right, welcome this morning. My name is Danny, this is Kate and Mariana and this morning we're gonna lead you in worship and all that really means is we're gonna sing some psalms together to God and, and about God and showing our gratitude for who he is in our lives. So we hope that you could uh, enjoy yourself. If you're new here, uh, you receive the bulletin on your way in. If you could uh, rip that out of there and, and kind of fill your information, uh, we would love to reach out to you and, and kind of get to know you and, you know, be part of this family. You know, at times it's a little frightening to come to a new church. It's a little, uh, you don't really know what to do, but we're just here to have some fun and kind of just praise God and, and, and worship God and, and give him all the glory and, and for all that he is. And if we could... Um, could you get up uh, for a minute and, and say hi to someone next to you?
This morning we have a new song. It's called Breathe. I would like to read a scripture in Psalms 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sounds. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounds of cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And this song is just going to, we're just going to talk about how we just live to worship him. That is the point of us being here singing together. We breathe. We were created to worship. We were created to lift up his holy name. And we just want to be grateful and, and thank him this morning. Yeah. 
Jesus out of prayer. Yeah, we worship you, God.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the fact that you are a faithful and good God to us. There's not one of us here in the room that uh, cannot attest to the fact that we have run from you, every one of us. All have sinned and fall short, so short of the glory of God. We've run from you, but there's one thing that you do so much better than us. You can run faster than we can. And you catch us. And you've taken hold of us by your grace, by your mercy. And you have not let us go. And even in those moments when we feel we are far from you, God, you are right there. You, will, you are the God who will not abandon us, not leave us uh, to fend on our own. We thank you that right now your mercies are new. Your mercies are new every single morning of our lives. And we wake up to a God who cares and loves. And Father, I pray that especially your love this morning will uh, maybe invade a heart that needs to be invaded this morning. Maybe, maybe a heart that feels just a little bit uh, dark or low or discouraged. And I just pray, oh God, that your love would invade each and every one of us in a fresh and new way today. So we pray, Lord, pour your spirit out upon us here in this place. Be with the discouraged, be with the depressed, the hurting. And Father, we think of our missions team down in Puerto Rico as they go down, and certainly, Lord, that, uh, that territory, Puerto Rico, has just had so much upheaval in these past few years, and we think of even the upheaval going on even now, right now, with the government, and uh, Lord, our team is down there, and we pray, God, that they could just be a, a bright, shining light, that as they... Uh, as they minister, as they seek to, to connect with individuals down there, Lord, that they would just uh, bring your love upon every person that they meet, every person that they connect with. We pray for homes that will be restored, roofs put on. We pray for that vacation Bible club that's going on in one of the churches that our teens will be helping out on down there. God, that you'll just be a great blessing in them and through them pray for their safety too, Lord. And Father, for us closer to home, we pray just, God, that you'll do a great work here in our midst. Again, we praise you and we thank you. It's in the name, the great and wonderful name of Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. All God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Thanks, team. You, got, you have to stay up here, don't you? Yeah. Okay. All right. There's more to come. Uh, welcome. It's so good to have you here today. This is a this has already been a great day for me. I just, I just love being here. I, I love I'm sitting out here worshiping, and it was just such a great opportunity. Um, I'm not the guy preaching today. That's why I could just be out here and just enjoy. And uh, so uh, we've got some things that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Danny mentioned about Connect Cards. If you are brand new, we'd love for you to fill out a Connect Card if you would. We're going to be passing the offering bags around in just a minute. If you could jot some information down so we could just connect with you, you can slip that in. That's all you have to do this morning. Please don't feel obligated to give. Just be our guest and do that for us. But for the rest of us, it's our opportunity to give back to the Lord because he has been so gracious, hasn't he? He is the good God. We just sang about that. Um, so let's take up this morning's offering, if we could, right now. We'll have the uh, folks come down the aisle. Um, we always say this every Sunday, but if you're like me, I don't carry cash, check. Um, and they don't have those swipey things either for credit cards, so they can't do that. But you can give in a number of different ways, and here are the different ways you can give up on the screen. As I mentioned, there's a bunch of things that are coming up. One of the things at the very end of the month that's coming up, which I love, we are going to have such a fun time, is our annual church picnic. And right after church on the 28th, we head down to Oxford at Buffumville Park. Um, anybody play volleyball? Come on, volleyball players. I challenge you to a duel. Uh, we're going to play some volleyball out on the beach, and we just have a great old time 
down there connecting. You know, you can't really connect with people on a kind of a deeper level on Sunday morning because we're here to worship. That's what, that's what we do. But times like that, that's when you can really kind of connect with people. So we hope you can come on out to the picnic. Um, all you have to do is sign up at faithauburn.info, and you can even see what everybody's bringing there. And that will inspire you. You can see that, you know, what Doug and Joanne are actually bringing to the picnic. So maybe that will inspire you. Maybe it won't. Maybe you'll say, oh, forget it. I don't want to come. Um, last but not least, uh, oh, oh, and don't forget two, two more things. The kids, we've got the big kids theater coming up in August. It's not too late to sign up for that. Starts August 5th. Uh, today, I think it's rather ironic. So we're here at the movies today, and it's rather ironic. On the hottest weekend of the summer, we're doing Frozen. So I think that's just appropriate, right? Doesn't that make you feel cooler? And, you know, I like this series because it gets... It forces us into thinking critically about the culture in which we live, and not enough Christians do that. We just kind of soak things up like a sponge, and we don't think, you know, about the things that we're watching. And so this is our opportunity to really analyze and put our minds into gear as to what messages are coming through. So today, I think you're going to be really uh, kind of inspired a little bit by Frozen and uh, and maybe kind of it'll the message will be clarified a little bit for us and uh, how the scriptures speak about the message of Frozen, how the Bible kind of relates to all this. So without further to do, Elsa behind me is going to sing.
Welcome, everybody. Let it go. Parents, I know what you're thinking. I come to church to get away from that song, from that movie. Six days a week, my kids watch it. And the seventh day is for rest from that movie alone. All right, no. I love, I love Frozen. I will confess that. I love this movie. Uh, number one, because this series, it was like the movie. I was like, I have to preach on that one. Because there's so much tie into what the Bible talks about, what, what, what the gospel message is. And I'm really excited to bring that today. But there's also more personal reasons that this movie is so close to home for me. And, and here's kind of why. This is my daughter and I singing one of the songs from the movie. Yes. It's okay to clap for her. It's okay. She's not in here right now, but I'll tell her that the whole church clapped for her performance of Love is an Open Door. But uh, the movie Frozen, it was a, it was a huge, massive success. Uh, the, it, it won two Oscars for best, uh, best Animated Picture, Best Original Song for Let It Go. Uh, it brought in... $1.2 billion in the box office. It was the fifth highest grossing movie of all time globally. Huge movie. And if you've not seen it, you're, you're missing out, all right? But um, I'm going to catch you up on the plot a little bit and um, tell you about it. So spoiler alert, part two is coming out in November, but I'm going to tell you about it right now, just the, the, the first movie. So Frozen centers around two sisters. You can see them pictured there. Elsa in the middle and Anna on the right. And Elsa has magical powers that give her the ability to create uh, ice and snow. And her sister Anna is a fun, energetic ball of, of energy who just always wants to have fun, always wants to play, and is always enticing her sister to use her gift and her powers to, uh, to have fun. And specifically, they talk about snowmen a lot. Hey, let's build a snowman. Do you want to build a snowman? Uh, and so everything's going great until one night when everything changed. And we're going to Look at that clip right now. Elsa. Psst. Elsa! Uh, wake up, uh, wake up, wake up! Anna, go back to sleep. I just can't. The sky's awake, so I'm awake.
Did you catch what the troll said? The first thing he said when they, her, her parents brought her to the troll. Born with the powers or cursed. And right from the get-go, everyone's assuming the same thing. This is a bad thing. This is a curse. This is not a good thing that, of what is inside of her. And even later in the movie, when her powers accidentally slip out, the townspeople all react the same way, out of fear. Because this cannot be a good thing. This is a bad thing. And, 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 but you saw what, what the troll said. You heard what he said. He said this. Your power will only grow. There is beauty in it, but also great danger. And the more that I learn about myself, the more that I learn about the way that I've been created, whether it be my personality or a, a spiritual gift that God has given me, the more I realize that that is true, that there is potential for beauty or danger. And let me give you just an example uh, of, of what that is in my life, you know, because the truth is that our strengths can so oftentimes be our greatest weaknesses as well. There is a, uh, a personality assessment thing out there called the Enneagram. Have you heard of it? Anybody heard of that? The Enneagram is similar to the Myers-Briggs or DISC test where there's nine types and you identify with one of the types. And one of the types is called the perfectionist, the reformer. That's me. It, it, it nailed me to a T. I am a perfectionist. And it, it's a beautiful thing when I bring beauty to my job and to what I do. It's a beautiful thing when someone comes to me for advice. You know, Matt, how can you help me? What, I'm struggling in this area. I can, you know, kind of analyze and look detail-oriented at their life and say, here's, you know, here's where I might be able to help you. It's a bad thing when I try to fix people that I have no business fixing because they haven't invited me into that. It's a bad thing, and it brings danger when I overlook the good about someone, and I'm so apt to criticize them because they can't live up to my impossible standards of perfection. And that's who I am. And now I could just be like, that's who I am. Deal with it. Or I could say, no, this is bad, and I need to more understand myself and, and the dangerous parts of myself and the beautiful parts of myself and how I can better love God and love people in this world. And, and we see that in Elsa. We see the beauty of her ability to bring uh, people together through her, her gift and through her power that she can create fun for her sister and, and for them to play. We also see the danger of it. And just in that clip of when she struck her sister in the forehead, we see the danger of that as well. And uh, the more that you look within, the more you see this potential in yourself for beauty or danger. And the, the same was true of Elsa's powers. We saw the full spectrum of them. Uh, but, but the troll gave her advice. He, he didn't stop there. He said this, you must learn to control it. Fear will be your greatest enemy. You must learn to control it. Fear will be your greatest enemy. Now, she's eight years old. That is terrible advice to give to an eight-year-old girl. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're going to be afraid the rest of your life, and you're going to have to try to control this thing, and you're, you're, you're going to just be afraid. I mean, it, it's terrible advice to give to an eight-year-old, but her parents take it to heart, and what do they do? They say, no, she will learn how to control it, but until then, we'll lock the gates, we'll close the windows, shut everybody in, reduce the staff, limit her contact with people. All right, sounds like, you know, a, 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 you're trying to create a serial killer here. Like, not, this is not good advice to give to an eight-year-old little girl. And they shut her off from the rest of the world. They shut her off from Anna. And what happens as the movie progresses is that the parents, just like in every Disney movie, I don't know what it is about Walt Disney, but I think it was because his own parents died. I think I heard that. But, you know, Elsa's parents move on, and they, they're in a boat, and you kind of see it, like, sink into the sea. It's a subtle way of saying her parents are gone. And Elsa and Anna are left in the isolation of the castle, isolated from the world and isolated from each other. And, and, and that's where they stand. And it's all because of fear. All because of fear. Elsa was afraid of using her, her gift to hurt her sister. She was afraid of hurting her sister again. And so I have a question for you. Here's, here's kind of the question I want us to ask ourselves today is, what is in you that intimidates you? What is in you that intimidates you? Maybe, maybe it's something like Elsa, you know, maybe you can build ice castles. No, but maybe you have a gift or an ability or it's your personality, but you're afraid of hurting other people. You're afraid because you've hurt people in the past. Maybe you are an outspoken person and 
you go into meetings and you, you feel like you have good things to share, but you end up trampling over people and hurting people. And so you come to the same meetings, you're like, oh, I'm just not going to share anything. I'm just going to shut up and just let everybody else do all the talking because I'm just going to hurt someone. Maybe that's the kind of mentality that you've had. Or, or maybe, you know, you, you just feel like, I'm not good enough. I don't have anything to offer to this world. I can't compare to what other people do. And God's maybe called you to, like, speak or to write a book. And you're like, there's a million books out there. What do I have to say? Nothing that is different from what anyone else has to say. And you, you just say, you know, I'm not going to do that. Maybe you're afraid of rejection or afraid of failure. And you feel like, you know, if I were to step out in faith and trust God and do this, that there's risk, and with risk involves rejection and failure. And so you'd rather just kind of sit on your gift and not use it. And, and th- we see this in Elsa's life. And as the story progresses, Elsa, she embraces this limiting belief. And a limiting belief is something that is not true, that limits our understanding of who we are, who God is, who the world is. And there are, there are negative beliefs that we believe about ourselves that limit us. They're not true. And this was what she uh, was taught by her parents, which parents do not teach your kids this. It is not good. But she says, conceal, don't feel. If you've ever had like a kid and you're like, you're angry, don't feel that way. You know, you're sad, don't feel. That's not a good, not good advice, all right? Your kids need to learn how to process their feelings. And her, Elsa's parents failed in that area. They said, conceal, don't feel. That, that gift that you have is bad. Don't feel it. And what they did was they put gloves on her, which, you know, helped her to not use her powers. But I think it was more like a placebo effect, like, oh, I have gloves on. Now I'm, like, able to control it. But what happens is she embraces this idea, conceal, don't feel. And maybe you've kind of embraced that in your life. You said, conceal, don't feel. I'm not going to um, embrace this. Maybe it's a dream that God gave you. You know, he's done a work in your life, and he wants you to do a work in others' lives through that same thing. And that could be your ministry. That could be something that God's called you to do. But you just said, I'm just going to conceal that. I'm going to stuff that because that's not for me. I'm not, I'm not supposed to do anything amazing with my life. Maybe it's relationally. You know, you, you don't want to step out in, in faith because you've been hurt in the past and to, to trust people again, to trust friends again, to trust, uh, to, to enter into a relationship with someone involves a lot of trust and you've been hurt. So you just say, conceal, don't feel. I'm just going to hide away in the isolation of my own castle that I've built around myself. Or, or maybe you are trapped in an abusive relationship. And you've gotten to a point where you don't call it that anymore. But if you were to ask your friends, you know, is this a healthy relationship? They would tell you the truth and say no. But you just kind of trapped in that. And you just concealed and not felt. You stuffed your dignity, stuffed your rights. And you said, this is just a normal relationship. This is normal behavior conceal, don't feel. Maybe you have the opposite problem of instead of being too trusting, you don't trust enough, and you jump from one thing to the next thing to the next because you're afraid of commitment. And you jump from job to job to job, and you kind of self-sabotage your own jobs because, you know, you're, you, you don't want to commit too much to something. And then you make excuses for why it didn't work out. Or in a relationship, you self-sabotage friendships and relationships because the moment a relationship starts to get deep, Ah, you don't like that place of vulnerability, so you book it for the shallow end of the pool. And we see Elsa do that in her relationship with Anna. That she just cut herself off from her sister, all because of fear. Because she was afraid of hurting her sister again. And so as the movie progresses, uh, she con- t- continues to embrace this limiting belief, conceal, don't feel, until Coronation Day, which is where the guards open up the gates, they let the people in, and Elsa is going to be crowned queen. And then the same day that she is crowned queen of Arendelle, her powers accidentally slip out. And everybody is afraid. They all think, that, oh no, this is terrible. This is a bad thing. So she runs away to the isolation of the mountains. And she embraces a new limiting belief. Let it go. Let it go. Just let it go. Just, just let it go. Just push past it. I, I'm, I'm not going to hold back anymore. And she runs for the hills. And as a, what might be a cute song for our kids to sing uh, that annoyingly gets lodged into parents' brains forever is actually terrible advice. It's actually really bad advice. Because as a result of Elsa letting it go, 
she ends up freezing over an entire town. And she ends up hurting her sister again. And she thinks that she's protecting her sister, but she's actually hurting her. And running away to the isolation of her own castle, away from anyone and anything that could ever help her to deal with her fear. And she runs away. She, she, she trades the isolation of Arendelle's castle to the isolation of her ice castle. All in attempts to try to do it herself, muster it up the strength, and pull herself up by her own snow boot straps. And you and I can do the same thing. Maybe you relate less to Elsa's part one journey, but part two journey really relates to you. You, you, you embrace this notion of just let it go. I'm just going to push past my fear with more intensity, more danger, more adventure, and whatever that might be. Maybe God has a call for your life, but you've ran away from that and said, no, I'm just going to embrace a new adventure, new adventure, new adventure. And, and if you know the story of Jonah and the whale, he was called. God had a plan for his life, but he ran away and embraced a new adventure, got on a boat with a bunch of guys, ended up in the belly of a whale. Maybe, maybe you've, you've stuffed that fear so much that you just uh, you know, embraced alcohol and drugs and sex and food, and you just add these things to your life to try to drown out that fear that you have. Or maybe you're all about a persona on Instagram, you know, and getting the right angles and making sure you appear successful and, and that you are beautiful and, and just telling people something that you don't even believe yourself, all to try to mask that fear, mask that anxiety, mask whatever emotions are inside. See, you and I, we need better advice than conceal, don't feel. We need better advice than any troll could give or, any, uh, or Elsa's parents could give. We need better advice than a, a song written by a moody teenager who had no disregard, complete disregard for the well-being of other people. We need advice that gets us out of the castles that we've built around our dreams, our desires, our personalities, our gifting. We need better news and a better advice than this. And the good news is that God has given that to us. Today we're going to be opening up the Bible and reading from a, liter, a letter by Paul to a man named Timothy. And it's going to be 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. This is Paul's last letter that we have recorded. It's his very last letter. These are his final words to Timothy, who was kind of his spiritual son. Paul kind of took him under his wing, and he, he, they, they embarked on ministry together. Paul taught him everything that he knew. And now Timothy, at this point in his life, is a pastor in Ephesus. He's a pastor of a church in Ephesus. And he's at the, kind of this place in his life where Timothy is a man of fear. He's afraid. He's anxious. He's timid. And it's not just like who he is. I mean, it's, it's who he is so much that Paul writes to him because it's now coming out in his stomach. He has stomach pains because he's so anxious. Anybody ever felt like a connection between your physical health and your emotional health? It's there, and Timothy is experiencing that. But not only that, but why is he feeling that fear? Three reasons, and I think you and I would feel the same amount of fear either way. See, here in 2000, you know, the, the, the new millennia that we are in, we have freedom to do this, to come together in a building and call ourselves a church and to sing to God and to hear God's word opened up to us today. But 2,000 years ago, which is the days in which Timothy lived, that was not allowed. Christianity was a new movement that was happening. And there was a guy named Nero. And Nero was um, increasing in power in Rome and persecution was rising up. So much so that Nero was the guy who took Christians, and I don't want to be too graphic about this because there might be kids in the room, but he would use them as human torches to light up his garden. He burned the city of Rome and blamed it on Christians. I mean, Nero was a crazy ruler, and Timothy is living in that day, and he's afraid. I mean, wouldn't you be too if you were living under that kind of persecution? Not only that, but there's also false teachers coming into the church who are spreading all of these, these lies, and they're saying, no, what Timothy's telling you, it's not true. Here's the real truth. And, and they're, they're spreading all this stuff. Not only that, but Timothy's own congregation doesn't think he's fit for ministry. Timothy's a young man. I mean, we don't know what, how old he was. Maybe he was 30 years old, but they didn't think he was fit for ministry. And they saw him being timid and anxious and fearful, and they said, we want a real pastor. We want a real leader. And Timothy's facing it from all 
angles, this fear, this anxiety. And what Paul would have to say to Timothy, I think, is what he would have to say to us today. And I, I am so excited to dive into just two verses today that I think are really going to unlock something for someone today that's being operated by fear. So let's jump in right now. He says this, For this reason I remind you. We're just going to stop right there for a moment because to be reminded of something means that you already knew about something and you were already told about something. And Paul is saying, I'm reminding you what I told you in my last letter. I'm reminding you what I've told you when I've seen you before. Here's the truth for, for you and I today, that we all need a Paul in our lives. We all need someone who's going to speak truth into our lives. Because without a Paul, without someone that's going to do that for us, we're going to fall back into the limiting beliefs. Conceal, don't feel, let it go. I'm not good enough. I got nothing to offer this world. But if you have a Paul in your life, they're going to, they're going to say, I'm reminding you that you are worth something. I'm reminding you that you have something to offer to this world. So don't back down. Continue to press in. So each and every one of us, I'm speaking to every single person in this room, you need community. You need someone to know you. You need someone to encourage you. And being in this room and being, you know, coming on Sunday mornings is one thing, but people can't really know you like they could if you were in a small group. And this is my shameless plug for small groups. I'm a small groups pastor, but I really firmly believe that every single person needs to be in community because you're going to find it elsewhere. I mean, you can find it outside of the church, but if you want to replace the limiting beliefs with the truth, you need someone in your life who's like a Paul. You need someone in your life who can encourage you and remind you of what God says about you. Amen? Amen. Hey, let's go on. So what's he reminding him of? He says, to fan into flame the gift of God. Already, this is not the advice of the trolls. This is not the advice of her parents. This is better advice, and we're going to see why. What is the gift of God? We don't know what Timothy's gift was. You know, Paul doesn't come out and tell us. But it was probably a spiritual gift of preaching or teaching or shepherding or leading God's people. And Timothy being an anxious man, that, that wasn't naturally in his personality and in his, the way he was made. But Paul's saying, this is the gift of God. This is what you've been called to do. And I see that in you. And so for you, what is the gift of God for you? Fill in the blank with something that God gave you, something that God gave you. Maybe it's a spiritual gift. Maybe it's something that's preaching or teaching, or maybe it's something like administration, helps, mercy, love. Maybe it's discernment. Like you, you can just see through people, and you can tell when someone uh, is not telling you the real truth. Or, or prophecy, and you, you have the ability to speak truth into people's lives. Maybe it's a spiritual gift. Maybe it's a skill or, or a passion or something that you do, whether it be musical skill or maybe visual arts like media, painting, video, whatever it might be. Maybe it's your personality. Like it's just innate in you to be a peacemaker. Like you just see both sides of an argument when people are arguing and you just want to bring them together and help reconcile those differences. Or, or, or you know, you can just sniff out inauthenticity and that's something that, that is just part of your personality. Whatever that might be, that gift of God, we know this, that just like the trolls said, they did say a little bit of truth here, that there's great beauty in it, but also potential for great danger. So whatever gift you have, whatever you have to offer this world that God has given you, it could be used for good and could be used for bad. It could be used for others or for yourself. And the question comes down to how is it being used? How do we use it? And, and here's his advice. He says, don't conceal it. Don't, you know, shut it down. Fan into flame the gift of God. Fan into flame. You know, here's a metaphor of Paul's bringing of fire. What happens when you conceal fire? It snuffs out. It needs oxygen to breathe, so you've got to breathe life into it. What happens when you let fire go? Forest fire. Brief story. About a month ago, maybe two months ago, I was helping a friend with his truck, and I know nothing about cars. 
um, and he's in the driver's you know, seat, and I'm pouring gasoline out of a water bottle into his carburetor or something like that. I don't know. And he's like, you know, I'll just, I'll just floor it, and you just pour it in. And keep going. I'm like, you sure? Okay. I'm just dumping the whole thing in. And all of a sudden, fire, and it goes up into the bottle, and I'm holding fire in my hand. Anybody ever held fire in your hand? It's hot. So I take it, and I throw it on the ground. We're next to woods, and I'm just throwing it on the ground. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm not going to stomp on that. There's gasoline that's on fire. It's going to get all over me. So I take leaves, and I just, like, cover it out. And then it catches on fire, and there's a bush hanging over it. I'm like, oh, no, this is bad. We're just freaking out. And this guy, he, he, who's like a couple houses down, he comes out, he hears screaming, and he's like, stomp on it. I'm like, I'm not going to stomp on it. Stomp on it. So he comes down, and just this guy just stomps on it. I'm like, you are bold. That is scary. I'm not doing that. But here's the reality. Fire should not be let go. It is made for a fireplace or a fire pit. Fire needs oxygen to breathe, but if you go too hard, it's going to spread like wildfire. And so Paul's saying, fan into flame the gift of God. Don't abuse your gift, but don't not use your gift. Understand it. Lean in. Take a gifts assessment test. Take a personality test. Better understand who God's made you to be. Look within to see how you can better love God and love people in this world. Lean into it. Understand it more. Fan into flame. And, and he says, that it, this is in you through the laying on of my hands. And what Paul's referring to is the event of Timothy's ordination. When Timothy was surrounded by Paul and the elders and they laid hands on him and they prayed for him and, as he became the pastor of this church. Now, not every gift needs that, you know, but, but that was it for Timothy. Now, I don't know for you when, you know, you were like, this is my gift, this is what I'm called to do. But the, the, this is showing for Timothy what it was. And we're going to move on here. And this next verse is where I think it really gets real for us. And I, I really want everybody to lean in here and listen to this. He says this, For God gave us a spirit not of fear. Not of fear. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. Now, it's lowercase spirit. This is not the Holy Spirit, but it is the Holy Spirit that gives us a spirit. That, that this is a, a nature of a person. When you became a Christian, and Paul's saying to Timothy, Timothy, when you became a Christian, your old spirit, your old nature, the person that you were before, died. Now, you have a new nature. You have a new spirit. And let me tell you, it is not one of fear. And fear, what he, the word he uses for fear, means coward. To, to flee from battle. To be someone who is a coward who runs away rather than running towards and running in. And Paul's saying, that's not who you are. That's not who gave, God made you to be, a spirit of fear. God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And we're going to hit on each of these one at a time. So power. Power is courage. It's boldness. If, if fear is coward, power is courage. It's to understand that the power you have comes not from yourself, from within. It comes from the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, you know, Jesus' last words to his disciples before he ascended to heaven, he said, you will receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will receive power from on high. This power doesn't come from yourself. It doesn't come from pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and just trying to be more powerful. It comes from surrendering to the Spirit of God. And I'm up here to be a living proof of that. If you knew me 12 years ago when I was in high school, junior year of uh, history class, I'm sitting in the room and it's set up in a semicircle. And the teacher, you know, had us each reading out of the textbook one at a time. I know how to read. I know I'm literate. I know how to read. But for some reason, when it got to me, my palms were sweating. My voice was shaking. I could not talk out loud. I was so scared. And that was not an isolated event. That happened when I ran for class president my junior year. That happened when I stood up in front of all my peers and made a fool out of myself shaking through my speech. <laughs> that happened continuously as I continued to try to, to do this. And I was like, oh, I'm not, this isn't for me. And I just said, you know what? I am not a public speaker. It's not who I am. 
And if you knew me back then, you know, I, was, I was a shy, timid guy. I think I was similar to Timothy. That's not who I am today. And, and through taking a uh, public speaking class, that was a way of kind of like fanning into flame. Like, okay, getting comfortable with it. Getting my feet wet a little bit more. Every time I come on the stage, I, I sit in that back room. I still have a little bit of anxiety in there. But I think it's just enough to keep this reminding that this is not me doing this. This is the power that comes from the Holy Spirit. I am not communicating my truth. This is God's truth. And that's what I remind myself every time I come out here. So for you, maybe you feel like, you know, I'm not a powerful person. But if you surrender to the Spirit, the power will flow through you. Power and love. We've all seen power without love, right? We've seen power without love. You've seen Hitler, Stalin, all of these people who had power, but they didn't have love. And what's so interesting about this movie, what I love about Frozen, is that as the movie progresses, Elsa ends up freezing her sister's heart in an act of trying to defend herself against her sister and trying to protect her sister. Ironically, she ends up hurting her sister. And and Anna is brought to the trolls once again. She's brought to the trolls, and they they tell her only an act of true love can, can thaw a frozen heart. Only an act of true love. And so Elsa, or Anna is brought to this fireplace with Olaf, the snowman you saw in that. He comes to life, you know, if you want to see the movie. But Olaf is next to Anna by this fire. And Olaf, as a snowman, is melting by the fire. But he says these words as Anna is trying to keep herself warm. He says, love is laying yourself down. It's putting someone else's needs above your own. Hey, isn't that in the Bible? <laughs> like, isn't that something that Paul wrote when he said, consider others more significant than you? That look to the needs of others before your own needs? Isn't that basically what Jesus said when he was in John 18, just about to be crucified? And he said to his disciples, greater love has none than this, that someone would lay their life down for their friends. And he would demonstrate that in that act of true love. And Anna with her heart on on the brink of about to being frozen, stands in the gap when Elsa is about to be struck by a sword. And Anna stops the sword. She freezes completely, stops the sword. The sword shatters. An act of true love that then melted her heart and melted her sister's heart. Jesus stood in the gap. When the sword was coming against us, And we deserve that sword because of the damage that we've done. But Jesus stood in the gap and stopped it. He stopped that sword. An act of true love. Love is laying yourself down for other people. It's knowing that the gifts you've been given are not just so you could be more powerful, so you could build a name or a platform for yourself. Your gifts are for building others up. They're for loving other people, for for laying your life down for the people sitting right around you. But power and love, they need a third component. Self-control. That without self-control, if you have powerful love, you're going to go charging into people's lives. Like, how can I help? How can I help? How can I help? How can I help? And, and breaking through people's boundaries when they're like, I did not ask for your help, okay? <laughs> power and love without self-control means you break through your own boundaries. It means you you say, I have no limitations. I'm just going to do whatever I can to help people. But self-control says, no, God has created me with limitations. And I have to honor those things. Self-control, here's something I've learned. Self-control doesn't come through trying. That was Elsa's problem. She's like trying to control this gift inside of her. Self-control doesn't come through trying. Self-control comes through dying. It comes through dying. It comes when you surrender When you die to yourself and you surrender to the Spirit, the capital S Spirit of God, and say, God, I am done trying to control things on my own. I am done trying to muster up this person inside of me and trying to be someone that maybe I'm not supposed to be. I surrender to you, God, because you surrender to me. It's when we do that that we remind ourselves, God gave us not a spirit of fear, but of power, love and self-control. Here's the big point today. There's not some flashy, rhyming statement. It's the Bible. 
It's, it's the truth that you and I need to replace the, the, the negative lies that we've believed about ourselves and replace it with the truth. So can we read this together? God, oh, sorry, go back to the last slide. God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Say it not like it's 9 a.m. Say it like it's like 1 p.m. God didn't give me a spirit of power, love. One more time. God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Amen. When you live this out, when you speak this truth over your life, if you write this down right now today, say, God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. You preach this to yourself every day. You speak that truth over your life and say, no, I, I'm not going to believe those negative lies concealed don't feel. I'm going to engage. I'm not going to just let it go. I'm going to have self-control. God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. So another rejection letter came in from yet another job opportunity, another interview that failed. Maybe I should just give up. Maybe I should just work at McDonald's, live in my parents' basement. God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. God's given you this ability to to speak truth into people's lives. And you, you notice somebody who is struggling, a friend who's struggling with the same issue over and over and over and over again. And you, you feel like God's calling you to say that to, to that person, but you're like, I don't want to hurt the relationship. I don't want to say that to that person. God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Come on, God could use you. You could be the agent of change in that person's life. If you were to just say, God, I'm your vessel. I'm an offering to you. Use me to speak your truth into other people's lives. God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. I'm, I'm in the last days of my life. I'm old. I have gray hair. I have nothing to offer to this world. I don't understand technology. I don't understand the kids these days. I feel like I'm just going to be abandoned and buried in the grave. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. Come on. But of power, love, finish it self-control. You have something to offer to the generation coming up. They desperately need your contributions, your input. You might feel like, you know, it's late in my years. Like, God's put a dream in me. It's like, I'm way too old for that. God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. No weapon formed against you shall stand. In the courtroom of God, you are his elect. You are his child. So run the race marked out for you. Persevere, press on towards the goal so you can receive the prize someday. Don't back down. Don't give in to fear because God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Would you stand for closing prayer? See, in just a moment, we're gonna sing one last song together. I have no idea what time it is. Oh, we're kind of over time, but... Let's, let's keep going, all right? We're going to sing this last song together. And, and the lyrics of it, I think, are so pertinent to what this message is today. Is This is what it says. Where there is new wine, there's new power. Maybe there's a power that you have not tapped into. A power that doesn't come from within, but comes from outside of you. There's new freedom, and the kingdom is here. I lay down my old flame to carry your new fire today. It's time to lay down your old flame. I'm not talking about your wife. <laughs> it's time to lay down your old flame and carry a new fire today. If anybody today is feel like there's just this old flame burning inside of me, it's barely there anymore, it's gonna be snuffed out pretty soon if I don't breathe life into it. And I wanna fan into flame that new fire today. To say, God, breathe your life into me today. It's only you that can awake my soul. It's only you that can give me a dream and a passion and a purpose greater than myself. So God, I surrender to you. I came here with nothing but everything that you've given me. So I pray that you would do a new work in me. I pray for new power. I pray for, for new surrender, for new self-control. God, I pray for new freedom because I believe that your spirit is at work within me.
self-control this week. What are you going to preach to yourself every day? God didn't give me, but of, come on, one more time. God didn't give me a spirit, but of power. I think you got it. Go with that message. Believe it today. We'll see you next week for Moana. God bless. See you next week.